This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Rich or poor, you're going to die. The heart under your breastbone is ticking like a parking meter, and eventually your hour will be up. You will not live forever. The question is, why are you alive at all? Given the brevity of human existence, can you honestly say you know why you're alive? Who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going? These are the greatest questions there are in all of human existence, and the answers are essentially spiritual in nature. To live without a spiritual philosophy enormously limits one's perspective. To see yourself and all of humankind as nothing but an aggregate of animals is an incomplete understanding. To attempt to fathom the meaning of life merely on the basis of passing events alone is like attempting to understand the world by occasionally glancing at newspaper headlines. On nearly every corner of every major city, there are newspaper vending devices through the clear plastic windows of which the passerby can read the headlines of the day. But suppose that were your total source of information about the world. Imagine that every day you squinted through the lucite window of a vending machine, read the day's headlines, then proceeded on your way, and that that were all you ever learned about the world. You would learn of murders, bank robberies, world wars, political elections, major cataclysms, tragedies, and problems of the planet, yet without learning thousands of other things of perhaps more lasting importance. You would not permit yourself the perspective of the editorial page, the insights of the columnists, the feature stories on the arts, literature, drama, films, comedy, the excitement, competition, and victory of the sports pages, the humor of the comic strips, the understanding of the processes of economics disclosed on the financial pages. It would be absurd to decide as a personal policy that you were going to limit your entire knowledge of the world to peering only at the daily headlines. Your perspective on reality would be fractional and fragmentary. Yet that is precisely the plight of every individual who rejects spiritual philosophy and espouses an entirely materialistic viewpoint upon reality. That individual is drawing his or her conclusions from such limited data that it is ultimately absurd. There is infinitely more to life in this universe than the fleeting material events. Life is more than wars, earthquakes, floods, droughts, and volcanic eruptions. There is love, understanding, friendship, truth, beauty, goodness, compassion, benevolence, philanthropy, service, giving, sharing, caring, and these by far are the more important things. Yet only a spiritual philosophy can begin to encompass such a total picture of reality. This is a friendly universe in which you dwell. And humankind are sons and daughters of the living God. Our origin is of the earth, but our destiny is beyond the stars, and an endless adventure of life beyond death awaits any and all of those who will dare to seek for it. This quest for immortality is in everyone. Historians estimate that in order to build the Great Pyramid in Egypt, 100,000 men worked for at least 20 years. This Great Pyramid was constructed for the Pharaoh Khufu. It's 755 feet square at the base, covers 13 acres of ground. It was constructed of nearly two and one half million blocks of limestone, each averaging two and one half tons in weight. These pyramids of Egypt, built nearly 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, are ineradicable monuments to the human yearning for immortality. As ancient as mankind itself is the longing to live after death. And the certainty, the conviction that man is more than merely a physical body, a living soul as well. There is more to you than flesh and bone. The ancients knew it, and we must not forget it either. Said Jesus, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? but lose his own soul. The political columnist Stuart Alsop wrote during his last year in which he was dying of cancer, a dying man needs to die as a sleepy man needs to sleep. And there comes a time when it is wrong as well as useless to resist. Death and dying are as much a part of life and living as sunrise and sunset. And until one comes to a philosophy of death, one has not come to a philosophy of life. There is a purpose for you which outlives 
your years on this earth. God created you for eternity, and eternity is now, and a fragment of infinity indwells your mortal mind this instant. You are more than you think you are. There is more to you than meets the eye, your own or anyone's. There is something about you, something within you, something so very much a part of you that it is impossible to speak of you without speaking of it. Like fireplace light glowing through the chinks of logs in a cabin by the wood, you've glimpsed these flickerings of holy fire within yourself. You've walked for years, perhaps in darkness, while a kingdom of light burned bright within you. That which you seek is nearer than you know, and you, the seeker, are sought. However worthless you may feel, divinity burns within you like a live coal, nearer than the marrow of your bones, nearer than the blood in your veins, nearer than the heart in your breast is the spirit of the infinite within, declared the Master. The kingdom of God is within you. Robert Laidlaw writes in his book, The Reason Why. Suppose that a young man should send his fiancée a diamond, costing him $500, placing it in a little case which the jeweler threw in for nothing. How disappointed he would be if, when meeting her a few days later, she said, Darling, that was a lovely little box you sent me. In order to take special care of it, I promised to keep it wrapped in a safe place so that no harm should come to it. Ridiculous. Yet it is just as foolish for men and women to be spending all of their time and thought on their bodies, which are only cases containing the real self, the soul, which will persist long after bodies have crumbled to dust. The soul is of infinite value. Thank God for that, for your soul, for your life, for your existence, the very breath in your nostrils and the pulse at your wrist. Whatever happens, whatever happens, you can still be thankful. I saw a woman in Brandenburg, Kentucky, being interviewed by a television news reporter. This was after her home had been destroyed by a devastating tornado. Ask yourself the question, what good could a person find in that situation? This is true. She said, I'm quoting her word for word. I wrote it down. She said, we were lucky. We left our front door open during the tornado, so instead of our house blowing away, it collapsed right where it was. Will blessings never cease? She said, we were lucky. Our house didn't swirl off into the sky. It just fell down. And yet precisely that is the spirit of optimistic outlook which can meet and master any adversity. Whatever happens, refuse to fall into utter despair and defeat. God has uses for your life. God has a will and wisdom for you. Thank God for that, for God's love and his spirit and his strength. Whatever happens, thank God, praise God, and worship God. For if you will seek for the will and the guidance of God, whatever touches your life can be turned to good uses and good purposes. And in this knowing of God and knowing that God knows you is peace like a river and joy like a running stream, a satisfaction in living your life, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, a man is relieved and happy when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. Give life your best. Love God. Love everybody. Do your best. You will begin to live thus joyously. H.G. Wells, the historian, had a fascinating insight into the nature of human potentialities. He wrote, Wealth, notoriety, place, and power are no measure of success whatever. The only true measure of success is the ratio between what we might have done and what we might have been on the one hand, and the thing we have made and the thing we have made of ourselves on the other. And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, The great thing in the world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. Epictetus declared, Difficulties are things that show what men are. And wrote Longinus, In great attempts, In great attempts, It is glorious even to fail. There's a mysterious, wondrous technique of spiritual guidance 
which can direct your life into new realms of tremendous meaning and value and discovery. Scientists in Chicago conducted an experiment in which a female moth of a rare species was placed in a room and four miles away a male moth of the same species was released. In spite of the wind, the honking horns, traffic noise of the city, despite the fact that the female moth was being kept in a closed room in a building four miles away from the place where the male moth was released within just a few hours in a way science is totally unable to explain. The male moth was found beating its wings against the window of that room where the scientists had confined the female moth. Salmon, which scientists have tagged and released in the Columbia River, have spent four years in the Pacific Ocean, then unvaryingly have returned to the very spots on the Columbia River from which they had originally departed. Every year, swallows are able to fly 7,000 miles through the air without charts, maps, compasses, radar, or radio, and return to precisely the location which they left six months before. Therefore, consider, if the very fish and birds and moths and animals of this earth possess such an uncanny ability to voyage from one location to another with such an unerring sense of direction, is it really so totally incredible to think that somehow human beings are also capable of utilizing an intangible sense of spiritual direction which can bring them to the very source and center of all things and beings. There is a spiritual urging, a Godward guidance within every person to seek for it, to become attuned to it through prayer, meditation, and worship is the beginning of a new and purposeful way of life. There's a reason for your existence on this earth. There's a meaning and direction for your life. And it can guide you into joy and love and peace and zestful living with an unerring reliability. Seek, said the Master, and you will find. Be not content, he said, to lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay up your treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, said Jesus, there will your heart be also. Blessed, happy are you, he said, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, for you will be filled. And he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the spiritual life. This is the supreme delight of existence. Living as the son or daughter of God, you were born to be, and in fact, you really are. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.